Hey, Adam Richardson here, pastor at Sandhurst. Thank you for joining us for this stream on your device. And we have prayed it would be an encouragement and a blessing to you on your journey. If you're outside the Sandhurst family, we hope that it will only supplement and not replace the teaching that you receive from your leaders and the care you receive in the church where you are plugged in. If you have any questions about renewing or starting a relationship with God through Christ, please contact us through the email or the phone below and we'll be in touch. A few tech suggestions for the best online experience. First of all, the bigger the device, the better. So ideally, you can plug your phone into your television. If you're having any tech trouble, you can reach out to Reeves Cannon at this number below. So we'd love for you also to repost and share this link so others can enjoy it as well. So we have prayed that this will be a blessing and encouragement to you. Enjoy. The scripture reading today is 1 John 1, 5 through 10. It is found in the Church Bibles on page 862. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word has no place in our lives. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, Ann. Well, before we jump into the text this morning. We're going to meet the team really quick. I finally got the band back together and I uh, wanted to let you guys know who we got on tap this, uh, this round. First, we have Karen Jobes. She is a brilliant scholar. She um, is a, got her, she's a professor at Wheaton and she got her PhD in Greek, so she teaches Greek. Now, you may think that's an odd uh, uh, career track for um, a woman to teach Greek at Wheaton Seminary, but it's a weird and odd career track for anyone. And, uh, but what's even more remarkable is that she got her, uh, she, it's her second career. She was originally in computer science out of Rutgers, and she was a computer scientist. She was very happy with that, teaching Sunday school, and then she realized she enjoyed Sunday school more than her day job, so she went and got a PhD, and now she's a professor writing commentary, so uh, she's pretty wild. Uh, of course, uh, we have here Karen Lee Thorpe, who did the, um, she's out of Yale, who did the Navigator study, brilliant. Um, here we have uh, Cruz, uh, he's an Aussie, he grew up in Australia, studied in London, PhD, studied in California, PhD, uh, ended up back in London, and now settled in Melbourne. Uh, oh, and by the way, he was a missionary to Indonesia for a while, taught at Cambridge, and uh, now he writes books, so he's got, a, got kind of a good world perspective there. Uh, this guy, Boyce, uh, will be a familiar name to some of you, James Montgomery Boyce, uh, 20th century out of Harvard, Princeton. And um, then he did his PhD in Basel in Switzerland. So he was the uh, pastor of the famous 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia and one of his congregants sitting out here every week to hear him was C. Everett Koop, if you know that name. Uh, so here we have David Jackman, the Brit, uh, also out of Cambridge, studied under Packer, pastor and lecturer. Um, great, great guy. Daniel Aiken right up the road here at uh, Southeastern Seminary. Um, this, um, John Hanna, was a, a seminary professor of mine at Dallas Seminary. Um, he is, he's not known for his brilliance, but um, he has, I mean, he, he got a master's at SMU and a PhD at UTD, so I mean, so he's got, he's got something there, but um, what he's really known for is his deep, deep waters of his heart. Uh, when I would study under, he was the chairman of the historical theology department at Dallas. He um, would open up a 50-minute class with a 10-minute prayer. <laughs> what professor does that? You know, 
mostly they're like, eh, amen, all right, you know. And, uh, and so he would, he would just go and go and go, and people ended up writing down his prayers. There are actually books of his prayers been printed. So, I mean, it's just, he has deep, deep waters. I love John Hanna. And this is, of course, the familiar face, John Stott, 50 years at... Um, and uh, Old uh, Souls in Langham in, in, in London. In 2005, Time Magazine named him one of the 100 most influential people in the world, okay? So that's not terrible, um, but John Stott, uh, good. So we've got a couple of Brits, a couple of Americans, uh, men, women, uh, world uh, missionaries. So we got a little something, everything there, and I really, really enjoy that. And of course, the main team is Will and Izzy, so I really appreciate those guys that we meet every week, and we kind of hammer through the main things going on, and so I really appreciate that team. But that's most of what we got going on right now, uh, and we are in First John, remain, remain in him, a study in the letters of First, Second, and Third John. Uh, you all are familiar with this uh, Okay, help me here. Venn diagram, please. There we go, thank you. Familiar with this. So there's kind of thing A and thing B, and then they overlap in the middle. They have some commonalities, but also some uniquenesses. Let's see if I can't seem to get, okay, there we go. So here's Danny and Larry. There's two people. And we're gonna be comparing Danny and Larry in the text this morning. Larry believes he, they have a lot in common. This here really is the most of it because they have a lot in common. Larry and Danny both believe they're Christians. They both uh, are respected members of their community. They both are trying to live their best good lives and be good husbands and fathers. They're, they both attend church uh, regularly. They both give and serve. They are doing what they can. They both struggle with some private vices um, but they, uh, they, they, they do what they can, right? And they both think they are, as the passage would say, according to John, they would both say that they're in the light. They're both children of God, and they both think they're going to heaven. Each will stand before God, and when their lives are reviewed, both will be comforted because their lives look so similar. Except there is one critical, decisive difference between the two of them, and that is that actually one is in Christ and one is not. Larry is in fellowship with God. He is a child of the light. So you see where I'm going, Larry light, right? And Danny is of the darkness, okay? So sorry, Larry and Danny, that's the way it lined up. But because what you do is important, the main thing about you is not what you do. It is who you are. So two boys, for example, are running through the streets of London. They run through the market. They act the same. They talk the same. They dress the same. Everything is the same, except when they run by Buckingham Palace, one boy goes past the gate. The other goes in the gate. Why? Because he is a Windsor. He is family. He belongs in the royal house. The other does not. And all the other similarities mean nothing at the end of the day because they are that different. The same is true with your house and mine, right? At the end of the day, the Richardsons come in and they are welcome to stay. Now, if you show up, oh, you may be welcome to stay also. It depends on who you are, you know? And... <laughs> Uh, but um, the same is true with God's house as well. The invitation stands all day long for all people to come, but at the end of life's day, only God's family will come into God's house. Most people, and maybe some people in this room, Think that salvation works from the outside in. What I do defines who I am. If I do good things, I'm good. I have a good heart. But John's gonna show us that this passage, it is life is the opposite. It is from the inside out. God's goodness personified in his spirit lives in us because of the blood of Christ. And we are born again and adopted into the family of God. And because we are family, then we do good things. We don't do good things and become family. And so those who are family are those who remain or abide in him. And that's what's at stake in these few verses. John's gonna show us how to know God and what's at stake if you don't. So pray with me. Father in heaven, as we engage these verses, as we engage your word that you've spoken to us through the apostle John himself, 
Lord, give us eyes to see. Lord, for those who are Larry's here and who walk in the light, however, however deep or shallow their struggles may be, I pray they be encouraged and strengthened. And if there are any Danny's here who maybe even think they're in the light and are comforted by the goodness of their lives, but they are not in your family, I pray that you would give them eyes to see and the courage to speak up and to reach out to you, to repent and turn to you, and to become born into your family. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, today. Lord, do it. Just bring your Holy Spirit, bring power, bring light, bring truth, bring courage, bring faith, bring humility, and may life grow in all of our hearts as a family. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to take a quick peek back at the first opening verses. This is verses one through four. It's what we hit last week. We've just begun the series on 1 John. And the key things about this are that the word appeared, the life appeared. And we said that the main thing was Jesus, who is God, became a man and came. And we proclaim to you, verse three, what we have seen and heard, so that you may have fellowship with us and with God the Father and his Son. Now, Fellowship, as we said last week, is not parties. Oh, that's wonderful. Parties, it's not food, it's not coffee. Those are all wonderful. Fellowship is sharing. It is a participation in what? One writer put it this way. Uh, the, Bible, the biblical word for fellowship is koinonia, right? The Greek word is koinonia. And there was really no way, there's no one word. If you've ever studied languages, if you ever had that word and you just don't know how to translate a word into another language or another language back into English, it's like, yeah, you can't really capture it. You don't really, it, there's no one word in our language that really, that really expresses that. And koinonia is one of those words. And so this is how one writer said it. Having no equivalent in the English language that captures the whole spectrum of biblical meaning, the depth of koinonia, translators would focus in each area on a different aspect of it. So Acts 2 focuses on the relationship between believers. They broke bread and had fellowship in their homes together. While Paul uses koinonia to describe the way he identifies with Christ's sufferings, John in his first letter here uses koinonia to describe what connects God to us and us to each other in Christ. Think about this use of koinonia or fellowship in Philippians 3. Paul says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in, that I may koinonia in his sufferings, that I may fellowship in his sufferings, that I may participate, that I may share in his sufferings. So in short, koinonia is basically, or fellowship, fellowship is the life of God at work among us. The life of God at work among us. It's the foundation of the one another. It's something that we have with God himself first. We have fellowship with God. We share in his life and then we share it with each other. It is, it is the, when we say we have fellowship with each other, what we're saying is that we share the life and the DNA of God. Okay. That is a big deal. That is a big deal. And so we're doing for one another what God has done for us. Loving one another as we love God. So that's how John defines what it means to be a Christian, right? Because uh, a couple has fellowship, right? So they get married and they have fellowship. They have unity and they participate in one another's lives in ways that are sacrificial, that are committed. They have a common goal, a common purpose. And then they might bring a child and then a second child into that fellowship. And then they have fellowship with the child. And then out of their fellowship, the children have fellowship with each other and then with the world. And the ultimate goal of parenthood is to launch your child to have fellowship with others and recreate their own fellowship in a home, right? And so this is how John defines what it means to be a Christian is to have fellowship with our Father. And we express it with one another. And so that's why we say what it means to be a Christian is to remain, to abide in Him, to continue in Him. 23 times in the little book of 1 John, He says, do this. Remain in the Father, in the Son, in the Spirit, in the light, in the message, in the truth, in His love. Remain in all these things. John, when he wrote his... Um, Gospel, he said it this way in John 15, remain in me as I remain in you. Jesus is talking. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine and neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. And if you remain in me and I remain in you, you'll bear much fruit. In other words, if you are really connected to me in a living way, if you have my sap flowing through your veins, 
you will bear my fruit in your life. My life will literally come out at the end of your branches. And your joy will be my joy. Your forgiveness will be my forgiveness. Your patience will be my patience. Your hope will be my hope. That we remain in him and we have fellowship with him and we share in his life with God first and then with each other. Apart from me, Danny, you can imitate it, but you can't be it because if you're not attached to the vine, you, have, you do not have the life of God flowing through you. You can imitate it, but you can't be it. And that is a critical, decisive difference. Danny can be very busy. He can be a productive member of society. He can be a really decent guy, but in the eyes of God, he is not a living member of God's family. He is separated from the fellowship of the life of God in this world and in the next. And so, today, we're going to see what John says about that. Again, he's going to talk about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to abide in him. So, let's take a look. Help me here. Next slide. Verse 5. Here we go. This is the message we heard and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Why light? Why is John starting with light? Why not God is love or God is holy? Light in scripture is two things, basically. Light means God's revelation. And it means God's purity. God's revelation. Things like, so God's revelation can be truth that is living or truth that is written. So God's revelation is uh, Psalm 119, thy word, right? I'm revealing my word as a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. When God revealed himself to the universe, he created it. Let there be light. And he was introducing himself to this new universe he was creating. Let there be light, the revelation of God. Uh, In Isaiah 9, 2, those walking in darkness have seen a great light. They didn't see this flashing light. I mean, the shepherds did, but when they got there, what they saw was a baby, Those walking in darkness have seen a great light, the baby Christ, right? And so God showed us his light. So light is God's revelation, but it's also his purity. The angels in Isaiah 6 who said, holy, holy, holy is Lord God Almighty had six wings and two of which they shielded their faces from the the sight of God. That's the purity of God. Ephesians 5, live as children of the light, for the fruit of light consists in all its goodness, righteousness, and truth. So the light is pure. So the light is the revelation of God. It is also purity. And John is explaining in this verse to say that God is light and in him no darkness at all. It seems like a simple thing, an obvious thing to you and me. But it's not obvious to people in the world, and this is why. If there's a God, and he's a good God, it doesn't take two seconds to look around and see a lot of evil out there and in here. So, where does all this come from? How do God, this good and powerful God, and all this evil relate? It's the ancient question. And there have been a couple of takes on the answers that John is answering right here. One answer is answer of monism. The Eastern religions, for the most part, take this view, that, there, that all is part of one essence, that the universe had, an, had a singular, singularity and everything that you think is good and evil is really just part of the same singularity. You're making up the difference in your mind. In fact, now this may seem kind of wild to you, but they think they're making up the difference between you and me in your mind, that we are essentially all just parts of one great singularity. And that's all that exists. And that's how they explain good and evil, is that it was just all part of the original. And that's why John says, in him there is no darkness at all. He's not saying there's no shadow in God. We don't have to worry when we get in the darkness, when we get in the valley, is God really good? Because this view says, God is all powerful, but he may not be all good. There's some light and there's some dark. And if if this idea of kind of pantheism doesn't make sense to you, maybe this version does. Um, This is the atheistic version of monism. Modern Americans would be happy to say, yeah, it just kind of all started, uh, you know, they like to talk about, the the atheists like to talk about Christians, you know, creation myths. Well, I'm happy to talk about the atheist creation myth because 
uh, you know, choose your myth because either, you know, what's easier to believe that an all-powerful being that exists outside the universe made it or that it made itself? And they always say, well, except for that one little thing, it all works. I'm like, okay, A, that's not true, but B, that's not a little thing. And so this is, this is their view that this is what they would say that, that, that good and evil are all contained in whatever Big Bang explosion we had. So that's monism. That's, their, that's how they explain the, the coexistence of light and darkness. A second way, and this is important, is dualism. And that is that, okay, um, good and evil are kind of out there. And, you know, there's a little good and the evil, a little evil and the good. This, kind of this yin-yang. There's, uh, there's night and day. There's land and sea. There's man and woman. There's... Uh, there, and so there, there are kind of these two opposing forces. Now, in this version, God may be all loving. He may be all light. Well, mostly light. But um, he's not all powerful because there's an equal and opposite reaction. There's, there's just kind of like this tug of war in the universe. That's the best way to describe it. A tug of war in the universe between good and bad. And we'll just see, you know, God votes this way, Satan votes this way. Which way do you vote? And if you don't, you know, get yin-yang, maybe you get this version of it. Okay. So these, these philosophies are not so far from us as we might think. These are man's ways to kind of grope around and figure out how does a good God deal with all the darkness and evil and the bad in our world? Well, how, does this, how does this work together? And John is going to take us in the direction of an answer. John is going to say, neither. Both of you are wrong. God is light. He is all-powerful. In him is no darkness at all. It's no monad, there's no darkness in God. He is only good. But if that's true, okay, if that's true, and I am in him, how can his light, his purity, mix with me? Even speaking in Christian terms, how can God's light exist in me? Because there's tough times when we face the darkness, not only out there, but in our own hearts. How do I have fellowship with this God? John's going to take us through three cases in the next few sentences. Three cases, false responses to God and the true, good, and living response. And track with me and see where Larry and Danny begin to diverge categorically. And you'll see, I think, how he answers it. God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Just keep that in view. If we claim, this is the first False view. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. What we're saying is that truth is not relevant. I can, A, God's good, that's fine, but, and I can believe in him, but do whatever I want. I can basically believe on Sunday and live like hell the rest of the week, and it's all good, it's fine. I mean, it's, there's no dissonance there, there's no problem there. And John is saying, if you do that, you are a liar. Because you're saying one thing with your heart and your mind and doing another thing with your life. We would call that a hypocrite. They are not Christians. Now, a rock solid principle, Psalm 5. For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. With you, evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all do who wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. Bloodthirsty and deceitful, O Lord, you detest. In 2 Corinthians 6, let's bring a New Testament verse in. What fellowship has light to do with darkness? Okay, so you're thinking, all right, yeah, light can't fellowship with darkness, but God is light and I have darkness. How can we have fellowship? Well, that's verse Seven, but if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. In other words, we have fellowship with God and with each other, not because we've earned it, not because we are of the light, but we have received the light and Jesus purifies us from sin. And so to be a Christian is not to assent to a philosophy. It is to have fellowship with a person through Christ. And this is the answer to the problem, walking according to God's light, his revelation, his pattern, 
and so forth. John says, yes, I know. I know you still sin. I still sin. We all still sin. But the blood of Jesus purifies us from all sin. When Jesus died on the cross, he wasn't just providing an example of sacrifice. He was actually paying the debt of holiness to God that all of us owed. In real terms, in real time. And when we came to know God, for those who do, we received the offer of forgiveness from God. We received the grace of God, the payment of the penalty for our own sin through Christ. We received it. And we didn't just do it once and then forget about it. It's a daily thing, not to be unsaved and resaved, but to have our fellowship renewed. So, I got married to Heather almost 22 years ago now. When we have a disagreement, that's code for fight, okay? <laughs> when we have a fight, we don't become unmarried and have to get remarried, do we? It doesn't break the marriage, it breaks the fellowship. The same is true in any relationship. If when your kids offend you, they don't quit being your kids. They don't break the relationship, they break the fellowship. And that fellowship should be renewed. And Jesus gave us a model by which we renew our fellowship with God every day. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He mentions give us today our daily bread, right? And forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Why do we need forgiveness? We already got it, because we need it again. Not in the same way. We only get married once. You only have the kid once, but you renew the fellowship day by day. Same with God. We are born into his family once and we renew our fellowship with him day by day. The way the hymn writer says, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief Rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. So we live in the light. But when we sin, the blood of Jesus doesn't lose its power. It is able to forgive us of the guilt and the shame. And to renew our fellowship with our Father. And so, John is saying... We should walk in the light. But when we don't, the blood of Jesus purifies us from sin. So that's the first thing. The second denial is to claim to be without sin. If we claim to be without sin, so the first one uh, said that the, that the sin is not relevant. This actually says sin is not real. And there are a lot of people in Florence today who think that oh, sin is not real. We don't talk about, it's hard to talk about sin in our world, isn't it? It's almost like a cute word now. Things are sinfully delicious or guilty pleasures. But sin is a horror that put Christ on the cross in order for God to be able to offer us forgiveness. It does matter. And time doesn't erase it. C.S. Lewis said this, he said, we have a strange illusion that time somehow cancels sin. I've heard others and I've heard myself recounting cruelties and falsehood committed in years and decades past as if they were no concern of the present speakers and even with laughter. But mere time does nothing either, either to the fact or to the guilt of a sin. The guilt is washed out not by time, but by repentance and the blood of Christ. If we have repented of these early sins, we should remember the price of our forgiveness and be humble. If we claim to be without sin, if we claim it's not real, we deceive ourselves. People can think that. People are free to think it doesn't matter. But it does, and this is why. In the Richardson house, there is a king, me. And there's a queen, Heather. 
And our kids are welcome to not believe in us. They're welcome to not believe in our boundaries. Guess what? They are real. The truth can be defined as that which corresponds to reality. Okay, that which corresponds to reality. So, they can believe what they want in their heads, but the reality is Heather and I have house rules, we have house boundaries, and they will be followed. And if not, judgment will follow. Judgment will follow disobedience. Reward will follow obedience. That's the way it is. And imagine a kid that, you know, doesn't want really any part of that, enjoys the internet, enjoys the, uh, the warm air in the winter, enjoys the cool air in the summer, enjoys the meals, but prefers to take them back to the room so don't have to deal with all the other lesser people uh, and, 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 and refuses fellowship with the family. There will be consequences to that, whether they like it or want it or not. The, the, the fact that you don't believe in the house rules does not make them go away. Amen? Amen. Guess what? The universe has a king. The universe has a creator. The universe is established on the principles of truth in God because he himself defines truth in his person. Jesus said, I am the truth. I don't just speak the truth. I don't just point to the truth. I am the truth. I correspond to reality because I am the ground of all being. And God set up, the king set up the universe in a certain way in which by he could relate to us, his creatures, and we could relate to him. And when we rebel, we don't just get away with it however much we want to convince ourselves it's true. We are guilty before the king, but the king has made a way for us to be forgiven, and we can accept or reject that path. And by the way, it's not only atheists and agnostics who refuse and pretend we have no sin. Many believers live like this too. Followers of Christ. So when was the last time, oh brother, oh sister, that you sat before God and confessed your sin and renewed that fellowship with your father? Or do you take your meals in your room? We also need to renew that fellowship with him. It's not just the pagan. Maybe this morning you, you confessed and renewed your fellowship with God. Maybe it was yesterday. Maybe you can't remember. And if not, today's the day. That's the second one. So the first one is not relevant. Second is not real. The third one, if we confess our sins, oh, sorry, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So to the person who says it's not real, you can confess, you can be forgiven. We repeat this every month at communion. Notice that the, 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 the first does not say if we confess our sins or not, he is a sentimental old softy and he'll forgive you. I think God, people tend to think God is like them. They are made in the image of God, but they make God in their image. Some grandfatherly guy who has this world, you know, wrapped around its finger or whatever, and they just think, I've got God wrapped. He's just going to forgive me. He's just going to wipe it. He's just going to, it's no big deal. Our sin cost God. He has made an offer of forgiveness. If you reject that offer, you will be judged and damned. If you accept that offer, you will be forgiven and received into the family. God takes our sin very seriously because he takes himself and his holiness seriously. It matters. He's not a sentimental softy, but he is faithful and he is just. Faithful to what? His promises to forgive, which is why we use this verse every month when we do communion and I invite us to have a, a time of private confession. And afterwards I say, receive the forgiveness of God based on his promise in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful to his promise. He is just because he's already paid that debt. And if you've received the payment, then you get the forgiveness. That is justice. And he will purify us from all unrighteousness and we can receive with confidence the forgiveness of God. 
So the offer stands to those who confess to be forgiven. The offer stands. Not sentiment. It is just and it is faithfulness. Faithful to his promises and just that Jesus has paid. Either you can pay for your sins yourself or receive the payment that Jesus himself offered. The way the hymn writer said, Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed ones of God be saved to sin no more. And so we celebrate the purifying of sin through the blood of Jesus and the gift of God. The third denial, the third way to handle, if we, oh, sorry, faithful and just. If we claim we have not sinned. So the first one said, it's not relevant to my life. I can just live like I want. The second one said, it's not even real. This one says, uh, it doesn't register. I'm not that big a deal. I mean, so if we have claimed we have not sinned, I mean, there's sinners out there, but I'm not one of those people. I mean, I do a little, I do something wrong, but I'm not like that bad. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm gonna give myself the benefit of the doubt here. I mean, I, I'm not an A student, but I mean B+. Plus. Um, the truth is, if we say that, if we say it's essentially no big deal, we make God a liar because he said it is. So Isaiah 53, all like sheep have gone astray. Okay, not all like sheep have just kind of done a little thing here and there, gone astray. Psalm 14, there are none who do good, not even one. They all alike have turned aside. Jesus himself in Mark 18, there is no one who is good except God alone. In Romans 3, what if some were unfaithful? Will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? Not at all. Let God be true and every human found a liar. Sin must be atoned for because it is a debt against God's holiness and it must be paid. And we can pay it by sacrificing ourselves in eternal damnation apart from the fellowship in the life of God or we can pay it, we can receive the payment of Christ who paid it on the cross for us when he died and rose again. So maybe you've realized by now you're not Larry, you're Danny. And maybe you're thinking, I'm not sure which I am. Tell a little story. You have to choose. So please tell God today, I choose you. I choose forgiveness through you or just reject him. But don't try to sit in the middle. There's a story of a guy sitting on the fence and the big angel walks up and Satan walks up, both big, both strong. And they both invite the guy to go with them. The angel invites him to the path of righteousness and light, and Satan invites him to the path of darkness. And he just can't decide. He's struggling which way to go. Both of them walk, start walking away. They're both inviting him. They're both walking away. They're both inviting. They're both walking away. And just at the edge of the vo vocal range, when he can't hear anymore, the angel and Satan meet eyes. The angel turns and walks away. Satan comes back to the fence, puts a cuff on the guy, starts dragging him off, and he said, hey, I didn't choose you. And Satan says, the fence is mine. The fence is mine. You have to decide to choose God or else not. How do I do that? I'm not even sure what I am. In either case, you can be sure today. John later in his book, and we'll see it later, he says, I have written these things that you might know that you have eternal life. It happened in Peter's day when he was teaching in Acts 2. He said, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch died and was buried in his tomb is here to this day. God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this, that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When the people heard this, they were cut to their heart and said to Peter and the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? 
Maybe that's you. Maybe you're wondering, what can I do? People, there's no magic words. There's no magic incantation, but you can do what Peter told them. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, for your children, and for all who far off. That's us in the Greek. We're the ones who are far off. That promise is for us, for all whom the Lord will call. Maybe the Lord is calling you today. You can turn to God and answer his call. Uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not into scare tactics, as you know, but a fact, it's a fact that there is three minutes of air in your nostril separating you from eternity. And some won't get that long. So, why take the risk? Repentance just means turning from self to God. God, John tells us here in verse nine, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I promise you, God has been pursuing you and making the offer and he's making it today. And some of you, this may be your last day. And God has put us in the way to say, this is the fork, decide. Choose you this day. Who will you serve? Let nothing stand in your way. Give the praise he deserves. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I did this when I was younger. The main thing is not to say the words. The main thing is to repent in your heart and turn to God and receive his offer of fellowship through the justice of the blood of Christ on the cross. So I'm gonna do something I've actually never done before in eight years here. If we would all please stand. If you believe in God, you know, last week, the parents celebrated 56 years of marriage. Is that right, Bill? 56 years. We did a renewal ceremony for them after 50 years. You know what? They just did it to do it, but they didn't need to. They didn't need to get remarried. They were still married. But we did it to celebrate the 50 years God had given them. If you're in here and you're in the light, you're a child of God, I'm gonna invite you to pray this prayer with all of us out loud to celebrate the work of God in your life. And if you haven't said it before, you haven't believed it before, you're not sure, say it for the first time today and be born into the light. And if you don't mean it, you don't want to be in the light, then you remain silent and let your, let your words be known to God in silence. It's not complicated. I, I, I found the, the prayer that Billy Graham prayed at the end of his messages, and we're going to pray that prayer together. So if you would, every head bowed and every eye closed, As we respond to God, take a moment, as Larry gave us before, and just say what you want to say to God, thanking him and celebrating the gift of his son and the forgiveness, or letting him know you want to be born into his family. Just take a moment silently and deal with God. So Lord, free in us those wellsprings of joy, of gratitude, of hope, because of Christ, not because of us, but because of you. And may we celebrate you, our King of Kings, that when we were in the dark, you ran to us and you drew us up, you drew us out and you invited us into your fellowship that you had with the Son and the Spirit. And now we have that fellowship with you and with each other. Lord, may it be sweet and beautiful for the sake of your glory. Through Christ we pray, Father. Amen. Amen.